officially the Corona Plaza Street Vendors Association as of March this year. This um, last crackdown of street vendors in Corona Plaza uh, speaks uh, a lot about the, the many unjust and, and racist immigrant politics and, and, and policies that will continue to impact communities all around the city. Um, the, the, the unsustainable cap on street vending permits is definitely an issue, uh, but there's, there, there's also so many missed opportunities in, 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 in really acknowledging the role that, that these community markets serve um, not just as a, as a strong social asset, but also as an economic attractor and 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 a place making practice. Not just for people in the in the nearby neighborhoods, but you know even beyond. And it, and it's ridiculously really. Uh, and 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 don't even get me started on on, on the harassment that comes with with uh, with vendors that are really just trying to make a living, pay rent, and 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 also just feed their families. Um, there was there was only one time when when it really slowed down that that harassment and it was when you know all of a sudden street vendors formed part of 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 the of the essential workers during the pandemic and they were asked to to continue working during covid and uh now that that pandemic is over you you kind of realize that essential was just another word for for disposable um and that that rate of vendors that that happened in July are are really just the the, the spatial consequences that many of these racist policies and and, and acts of displacement continue to um, to enact on families. So my my spatial practice really just um, aims to work uh, collaboratively in weaving together, you know, political activism, art interventions, design, equity, and and even just the acknowledgement of of people and context and, and histories when we really just think about um, how we how we make and redefine our neighborhoods and communities. And, and I'm not just talking about what happened in Corona Plaza, but also, you know, other parts in New York City where there are big immigrant communities. But, you know, at the same time, there's this lack of engagement from the city um, with the residents and the workers. Um, and this ranges from <laughs> a lack of empathy to language barriers, and even uh, uh, culture disassociation. You know, I'm, I'm an architectural designer, but also I'm a social practitioner. And I know that sometimes traditional plans and sections and renderings are, are, are not the only tools that we should be having at our disposal for, for discussion. Um, it's, it's really, really easy to get rolled up um, in the professional world. You know, um, you forget what really matters. And and why many architects decided to, to to study the profession in the first place, and and that was to to make meaningful change. Um, many times, p public uh, participation in our neighborhood takes on a very, you know, superficial and more of a prosthetic role. Um, it'll either be like random community pop ups, or the community will be brought in too late in the game to even have a say. Um, and it'll be masked in, in, in many different ways, but the, the reality is that in many cases, all of the planning strategies have already been set in stone and, and by quote unquote uh, professionals that really have no association with the people being affected the most. So, so yeah, it becomes a, a, a gimmick or, or a checkbox. And I, I, I think we really need to, to think about how we can make architecture relevant in, in underserved communities. And, and you know, that, that means hearing the voices and the stories that are not normally taken into account. You know, and, and a lot of the work I do at the Spitzer School of Architecture, um, alongside some really incredible faculties to understand really the amount of agency that our public university has in, in, in impacting communities who who do not have the economic uh, resources to redefine and plan for a city that was not designed for them in the first place and continues to exclude and ignore them. And so um, my, my hope actually with this project here is that people with the task of designing our shared environment, you know, whether you're an architect, an urban planner, 
uh, a policymaker, whatever you are, you need to question whose stories are being valued and are actively involved in, in, in the making of these public spaces. Otherwise, we will always get the same outcomes and views where we're so desperately trying to dismantle. Um, in the case of Corona Plaza, it's, it's obviously a, a different culture of ending that than what um, people are here are, are used to, but that doesn't mean we, we should ban it. I think we should instead, you know, learn from it. And the only thing that these vendors are asking for is, is, is really just a seat at the table to collectively discuss what the possibilities of, of this place could, could, could be. And many of these workers have really just sustained themselves through self-run organizations. They've, they've helped transform places of of leisure into into places of work, community, culture, and identity, and 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 so I think the city really just has to start building building culture rather than trying to to control it. There's there's really no sides fits all, and I, I I believe that making spaces for vendors is a is a start of being more reflective of the complexities and diversities of the city. Um, in order to, to, to help shape and cultivate more resilient, um, equitable and, and meaningful places.